I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Ms. Anne Shaftel, and I'd like to say a few words. You will see in the middle of this lecture that certain questions pop up, and those have been put in there deliberately. As you know, we have a lot of students who are now participating in the museology and conservation program of the CSMBS and other institutes. We had an exercise with these students and they came up with some really, really good questions. So we have inserted them into this talk and shared them with Anne Shaftel so that this makes it a more meaningful evening for all of us. Anne Shaftel's work is at the forefront of Thanka conservation. As you heard, her title is Conservation of Thankas and the questions and, it con and concerns that arise from the conservation. Since 1970, she has worked in conservation of Buddhist art for governments, museums, universities, dharma centers, and monasteries, and is fellow of the International Institute for Conservation, fellow of the American Institute for Conservation, member of Canadian Association of Professional Conservators, ICOM, and ICOMOS. Her International Monastery Preservation Project, called Treasure, Caretaker, and Training, which, is, which has a website, www.treasurecaretaker.com, won the pre prestigious Digital Empowerment Foundation Chairman's Choice Award. Her lectures, seminars, research, and numerous publications continue to serve as valuable resources in museums and monasteries. Preservation of Buddhist Treasures Resource, a free online resource written in response to preservation questions from monks and nuns, includes a comprehensive and richly illustrated section on Tanka preservation. Tanka preservation, as you will see as the evening progresses, is as complicated as the Tanka form itself a complex composite art form spanning centuries and continents and still evolving. In this interactive talk titled Conservation of Tankas, Anne Shaftel will address a few questions and concerns which arise when either a lay person or an expert thinks of tankas and their conservation. It will include important fundamental points of the Tanka forms, history, purpose, preservation, evolution, and the complexities of preservation of this sacred art form. She will cover literally the DNA of the Tanka. So welcome Anne Shaftel to the Museum Society of Bombay and our other co-hosts, the Xavier's College and, the C and our beloved CSMBS. And I now hand you over back to the tech team to start the lecture. Thank you very, very much for joining us, everybody. Hope you enjoy the evening. I'm sure you will. Thank you so much, Feroza and Jason. I really appreciate this invitation. And I also would like to express my gratitude to my Buddhist teachers, to conservation colleagues and mentors, and to the funders who have enabled me to be able to work and concentrate on preservation of Buddhist art through 50 years time. Thank you. I also welcome everyone who's here today with us for this Zoom and to those who are taking the time to watch the, the video in the future. Thank you so much for joining us and I welcome you. Tanka preservation. And this webinar is about your questions and your concerns. Tanka preservation is as complicated as the Tanka form itself, which is a complex composite art form spanning centuries and continents and still evolving. This event is based on your own Tanka questions and concerns and will include fundamental points of Tanka form, history, purpose, preservation and evolution, and the complexities of preservation of the sacred. So I actually have spent uh, quite a bit of time putting step-by-step um, -step, uh, Tanka form information into this comprehensive Tanka webinar, and here's the link. If you have any further questions following this presentation, I welcome you to get in touch with me. Thank you. 
summing up con Tanka conservation science. You want to store it, handling, and display. If a Tanka is damaged, simply stabilize its condition. Never try to make a historic traditional tr Tanka treasure look as if it were painted today. Respect the evidence of traditional use of a sacred art form. Tankas are not dirty and therefore cannot be cleaned. Blessing substances are part of the history of the tanka and there is no varnish layer. Often severe cleaning, overall consolidation and recreating missing iconography for a tanka painting, usually for museums. Because you want it to appear clean and new is never successful, and you can create permanent change and damage. If you want a new looking tanka, have a new tanka painted by a traditionally trained tanka painter and the textile surround sewn by a traditionally trained tailor. They exist and they're waiting for you. Tanka is a sacred art form, but conservators work with cultural heritage treasures from diverse world religions. Discussion about sacred art is so interesting because sacred is a definition that is intangible. And yet we are dealing with tangible objects, things that are made of atoms and molecules. A big question for people on a very personal level and a professional level is what defines something in a material object as being sacred? Is there a line up to where it's not sacred and then it becomes sacred? Or is it something in its physical makeup that makes it sacred? What kind of ceremony or whom can transform it to being sacred? Can something happen to an object during its history that make it either sacred or that erases its sacred qualities. A lot of these questions are addressed in preservation of a Buddhist treasures resource. We wrote this in response, direct response to questions from monks and nuns and their community members. And it's illustrated with their questions and images from monasteries. It includes sections on text preservation, wall painting preservation, and emphasizes documentation. We teach documentation in workshops in a way that's completely confidential within each monastery because the monks and nuns are doing the documentation themselves. And therefore, they can keep all the information confidential. This is so important. And we teach a way to use their own smartphones. It's low tech and effective. We emphasize video interviews of elders because elders hold the history of sacred objects. Safe storage, emergency planning and disaster mitigation is so important. That's all included. And this talk and the resource is based on risk assessment. Risk assessment for tankas, which we'll talk about. Risk assessment for Buddhist treasures, whether in monasteries or in your collection includes water, pollution. We know about pests, especially monkeys, for example. Uh, human choices. The pandemic is now a risk. Theft, earthquake fire, temperature and relative humidity, and light. Risk assessment, you may think is so scientific, but actually when we present it in our workshops and we'll be using it today, every monk and nun has many examples of how these risks appear as, as threats to their own monastery treasures in their own monasteries very enthusiastic and practical. I love these workshops and working in monasteries. Tanka preservation is a huge section of our resource. It's going to be over 500 pages and we're still working on it. Tanka is a complex composite object, 
I like to call them tanka sculptures. If you see a tanka uh, hanging outside in a tent or in a monastery where you have drafts from windows or butter lamps, etc., people walking by, it waves like a sculpture. It behaves like a sculpture, not like a flat painting. After all, it has so many components. It has wood, metal, um, painted textile, heavily brocaded textile. Um, it has leather cords sometimes. They're all put together in a sculpture form that sometimes is at war with itself and very difficult to preserve. Most people think of tankas like this, that they see in many museums. Is it a tanka if it's only the painting without its textile mounting? Is it a tanka if it's only the textile mounting but without a painting or other iconographic panel in the middle? Usually, only the painting is in the picture for tanka appreciation. The tanka form is at war with itself. For example, the panel in the middle is sewn in tightly to its textile surround, and therefore changes in temperature and relative humidity cause them to react differently. If you were to have a tanka resting flat in perfect storage, perfect low light levels, laying flat, um, temperature and relative humidity controlled, it would still deteriorate. It's what we used to call an object with inherent vice. In other words, the tanka form itself is difficult to preserve because within itself it's deteriorating and especially from traditional usage. Tankas are three-dimensional and well, generally this is what people think a tanka is. And why is it like this? For example, this is from my study collection. Uh, I lend my study collection to museums and use it in workshops. This is a tanka of a Buddha. It dates from the 1900s and was damaged in the Nepal earthquake. It was a present. It's complete tanka form with the surround, the textile lining on the reverse, the yellow silk cover, wooden dowels top and bottom, flat ribbons that traditionally hang over the iconographic panel, which irritates a lot of scholars, cords to hold up the tanka and hold up the cover. And did you know that the textile mounting has its own iconography? Without the textile mounting, some people consider that a painting alone is not a full tanka. Why is the tanka in that form? Because traditionally, it traveled with the monasteries and with people on yaks through the Himalayas. In other words, everything had to be rolled up and put on the back of yaks, especially when great teachers traveled from valley to valley to offer Buddhist teachings. This is a gar, which is a Buddhist teaching tent, and they still happen today. And everything traveled on the ox, including the tankas, the texts, the tent, the robes, food, everything. That's why tanka is traditionally rolled up. Here is a modern gar or traditional meeting where you have many people coming to hear teachings by a great teacher. And they're unrolling the tankas and hanging them up and then rolling them again. So tankas are receiving the same treatment as they did in the tradition centuries ago. This causes splits in the support. By the way, the secretion you see is from blessing substances. It's not dirt. And it causes great damage to the painting itself. This is a raking light image of what a traditional tanka looks like because the hand ground pigments give it a very three-dimensional quality. It's not flat like a poster. Therefore, you could imagine when this is rolled and unrolled, it's going to be damaged. You could see the lines of damaged already from rolling. Traditionally, tankas were stored, rolled up and stacked on each other. This causes immense damage. And this traditional caretaker is gripping it in the center and uh, also pinching the painting. Not everyone can afford this perfect storage. This is at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. 
the perfect tanka storage. You can see uh, here, tankas have their own drawer. They're locked up, the light is kept out, no pests, everything's perfect, the security is perfect. This would be ideal. But not only can most museums not afford this, but most, most monasteries definitely cannot. So they're very simple and inexpensive ways to create storage flat for tankas. So you don't have to roll them. After all, when people want to roll tankas, I ask them, where is your yak? Do you have to travel with it on the back of a yak? That's my introduction to the tanka form. And now it's time for your tanka questions. I'm very excited about this. The first question. I love this image. Thank you for sending it of you working. It would be great if you could elaborate on the significance of the blessings of the tankas. I also wanted to know whether the blessing marks, if present, are conserved as well. Do they need conservation? How is its authenticity preserved? Well, it's not just tankas that are empowered. Statues and even the stupa or chochen is empowered. You can see heaps of texts being put inside for an empowerment blessing. Plus sometimes old, old tankas, because they're imbued with blessings, are put inside stupas as well. In answer to your question, empowerment. How does a tanka get empowered to represent the energy of, it, of its deities? If there's no inscription, can you tell if it was ever blessed? Is a newer tanka more blessed than an older tanka if it was blessed by a great teacher? If your conservation treatment obscures the blessing syllables or symbols, does that affect the strength of the blessing? Are tankas still blessed if they have been in a museum for a century, for example, rolled up in storage? What about the, the blessings substances? This is a tanka that has blessing substances. The chopan or shrine offerer might flick blessing substances towards the shrine and the tanka also. And this is um, accretions are part of the history of the object. Whereas these dots are fly specks. You know, there was a conservator who goes around and gives out little like wooden sticks that are used for barbecues. And he teaches monks and nuns to gouge out the fly specks and the traditional blessing substances to make it look clean. But actually you're just causing a lot of damage and removing history of the object. This tanka is not dirty. The darkness you see is from offering substances, butter, lamp, smoke, and incense grit. It is truly impossible to remove because there's no varnish layer like in Western paintings. You'd have to definitely create deep change and disturbance and perhaps damage to tankas to make it look new and clean. Please leave it as it is. This is a blessed tanka totally blessed by hand and footprints of a master teacher through the centuries and someone cleaned it and you can see that it did not have a very good result. If you're asking about the blessing syllables on the back, this transmitted light image of this painting, by the way, I'm not brushing it with a brush. I didn't want to point because it's not polite. So I use the brush to indicate where the blessing syllables are. This transmitted light image shows you the blessing syllables, the head, the heart, and the body, Omahum, plus handprints and signature. Here is the master teacher, the 16th Karmapa, doing his handprints and signature on the back of it. You know, scholars are also very interested in the blessings. For example, these scholars are looking at the inscription on the back to see whose handprints as empowerment is there. Some uh, Buddhists believe that the back which has the empowerment is actually more valuable due to the blessings than the front which has the iconography. That's how important the empowerment is. So you have a great question. This is a genuine empowerment. And this makes me very sad because this is uh, a fake, it's a fake tanka here I'm pointing to 
because it was sold as old, but it's new. That's what a fake is. And someone put a fake handprint empowerment and the syllables are in the wrong place. It's very disrespectful. There are tankas with elaborate textural inscriptions on the reverse and with iconographic labels on the front. Tankas and texts go together. Centuries ago, not many people read. So in order to understand what they were to visualize in their meditation practice, they had a picture of the text. Many tankas have inscriptions and empowerment as text on the back. Often um, due to the rolling and unrolling in storage, it gets damaged. And in order to, it, to have it translated, we use um, apps on our phone for post capture light enhancement. The blessings on the back are significant. However, if you don't see a blessing, it does not mean that it was not blessed. A great teacher might have gone by and flicked rice or just said a prayer and it's equally blessed. Again, post capture app on the phone to bring up inscriptions front and back and empowerments that are no longer visible. I have concern with uh, modern teachers uh, to write their empowerments. They're using whatever ballpoint pen or, or mark, marker that somebody hands them. This is from a great artist and meditation master, uh, Kamtul Rinpoche in 1970. He used a ballpoint pen for his signing, signing and his date, which he rarely did to bless a tanka. This is a rare example. And by now it's all faded because the ballpoint pen faded. These are not empowerment syllables. They're just marks on the tanka that show you perhaps uh, the collector's mark or where in the temple it were, was to hang, custom stamps. So thank you for that question. Next question. How should the light be placed so that the tanka is visible and it's not even damaged by the light? Very good question. Let's refer to our risk assessment chapter. Risks to tankas, light is a big one. Bright sunlight can equal 30,000 lux, but dyes and textiles start to fade at 50 lux. Okay, tankas look pretty good, some of the old ones, because in previous centuries and older monasteries, windows were tiny and electric, light, electric lighting was just not available or even invented centuries ago, so that the overall light exposure was significantly lower than it can be now. Rooms were darker. Museums work with this very need for exhibition lighting to keep uh, light levels low, as low as 50 lux. So what they do is that the entrance to the room is darker so that you slowly, your eyes slowly adjust. And with a lower level of illumination, you can see quite well, like in old monasteries. Just have to adjust. So if you want to prevent light levels to your tanka, in answer to your question, filter the sun from the outside, control your lighting in the inside. Choose your light bulbs carefully and turn off the lights when no one is there. Modulate the light coming through the windows. Replace any old tube lights with LED lights. It's very simple. With light, as with other risks to tankas, prevention is the best cure. Here are some examples of probably what you're asking me about. High light levels for tankas. This is a textile tanka in India. Again, you can imagine how much damage this is causing with the daylight, 30,000 lux. This is a tanka exhibit in a temple. And you can see that these spotlights, which are fluorescent spotlights, are so bright and they're burning um, a visual hole in the picture so the people can barely even see the center of it and causing great fading and other damage. This type of lighting is not necessary. This is from a museum in India. They've since changed it where they had for decades uh, a fluorescent tube on top of this tanka in display and uh, the cover, the fine cover deteriorated. This is a temple in Hong Kong where the light comes in from the outside and there's fluorescent lights on top and a temple in Bhutan where fluorescent lights on top 
and the sunlight's coming in below. What can we do? It's simple. LED and also sun filtering screens are easily available. They cut out the intensity and the UV content of the daylight. This is a temple that's using them. Here's an example. You can hardly see them in the windows. This is the screen down and this is the window. It cuts out the UV and reduces intensity to protect your tankas. In the nunnery where they didn't have those, the nuns sewed this traditional cloth cover. Very successful, thank you. As scientists, we measure the light for tankas. We measure the UV content, the intensity, and the light patterns through the day and night. You can do this. Light is our friend as conservators because we use it with safety to show us more about the objects we're examining. This is different types of light. Plain light, uh, raking light, we use transmitted. And this is that light apps to show us things in damage and condition we might not see. It's amazing. This is plain light. This is examination from Tank I was doing in Sweden. And this is, this is raking light from the side. This looks in good condition, but you can see the true condition that's revealed by light. So we can use light as conservators, as our friend, to give us information about tankas. So your question about light was very good, thank you. Next question, is the cover of the tanka, if the cover of the tanka is lost, does it affect the authenticity of the tanka? And the wallpaper here is a tanka cover. This, uh, Taylor, and usually the tailors were men, but this is a delightful picture from Kathmandu, is sewing uh, tanka covers. This is the cover material we use now. Because a traditional cover material, as you see in these tankas underneath, is no longer available. It's so rare and so fragile. I have a study collection of tanka covers. Because when tankas were first collected, uh, the covers were ripped off and discarded. I collected them then. Uh, they were given to me at just, um, you know, from the garbage, and I collect them uh, for study collection. And the thing is that the, the paintings were removed, their mounting, and only paintings were considered important. But now these covers are rare and significant. This is a historically important tanka, and you can see the cover has been ripped off. This is a modern tanka with a modern cover, which is very different. But you know, this tanka here, it never did have a cover. This form of tanka mounting never had a cover at all. So just because it doesn't have one doesn't mean that it's insignificant. There are many, this is from the collection in Yale, um, the Beinecke Library, very elaborate, many panels. And um, this is a, a kind of gift tanka with um, valences on top. Traditional tankas are gauze weave on a very narrow, um, very narrow loom. So they're usually sewn together and decorated with a vegetable stamp dye. Vegetables are cut, dipped in different dyes and stamped on. They're often sewn together in pieces. You could see the fine gauze weave and how fragile it is. traditional tanka, splitting. Some have woven designs. And because of the raising and lowering, a traditional gauze weave tanka covers often get damaged. And that's one reason why uh, museums and collectors used to just take them off. They also have a tooth, what's called a tooth, which means that they cling and they stick. And often you can see that this tanka cover is clinging to the painting. And if the painting is fragile, it can pull off pieces of the pigment. So when you're storing tankas, please put um, either a fine cloth or tissue um, between the tanka painting and this cover. At the top, they often become damaged due to rolling and unrolling. And if there's any water damage, uh, there is transfer of dye. There have been attempts to uh, conserve tanka covers like this 
and uh, it looks good from the front and uh, combination. This person used a combination of, of adhesive and sewing. And the reason is because it's raised, when it's raised traditionally, then uh, it, it's a lot of stress on the fabric. You can see that, how an old fragile tanka cover would suffer from this, but yet it's very traditional and looks beautifully when it's raised. Next question. Which one of the two, an all textile tanka or tanka with painting on paper is more difficult to preserve? Beautiful picture, thank you. Actually, a tanka is a sculpture. And preservation of the entire sculpture, tanka sculpture, first of all, is preservation to prevent future damage and then stabilize any damage. <laughs> In museums where you have a vast conservation staff, you can have a painting conservator working on one part of it, a textile conservator working on another, uh, I have worked on the whole Tonka sculpture from the beginning since 1970, and therefore you get a balanced preservation effect. Copying is traditional. So if you're asking which is more difficult to work on, the painting, which is on cloth, not paper, or the textile, it really depends on the technique, the methods and materials they were made from. This is older, an older tanka support and, and painting method, older tanka textile surround, and this is newer. And perhaps you'd have to use different stabilization methods for them because of methods and materials. Again, older and deteriorating in a certain way from traditional use um, and damage and newer and uh, deteriorating as we see um, from light damage. So you'd have to really do a lot of research into the methods and materials first and then decide what stabilization methods you use. It's not that it's easier to work on the painting than the mounting or vice versa. Every tanka sculpture is different. And tanka sculptures are changing. So you asked about paper, but this is a plastic iconographic panel. This is printed on plastic substrate. Traditional textile around it, plas plastic substrate center. And this, which my uh, favorite nuns still call a tanka, is totally printed on um, kind of polyester flocking. And this is considered a tanka. So you would have to um, preserve this plastic, textile, totally plastic. And then we're getting into the world of popularity of digital tankas. On Facebook, there's digital tanka groups and they do amazing things with digital tankas. And here uh, is a digital tanka. Would you preserve it online? Would you preserve it digitally? If it's printed and put within a traditional surround, you'd have to preserve the substrate it was, it was printed on. So, it's a complicated question, preservation of the tanka sculpture. Thank you for asking. And then you'll want to know if something newer is spiritually less significant when you're working on it. And you'll also want to know as a conservator, well, look at this painting. It's framed as paper. And you asked about paper probably because it looks like um, paper objects are framed. This is in a museum without the full tanka form. It's actually painted on cloth. Complicated and difficult is the preservation of large textile tankas. Very complicated. You can see this is in use. And that's because if you look on the reverse of a textile tanka, it's so complicated in its construction. I would say this would be a real challenge for you. So thank you for asking that question. Next question. And we're running out of time, and I want some questions from our audience today. So I'll go a little faster. Gemstones and the benefits of owning a tanka, according to Buddhism. I think uh, to the second question, it's not so much that you would own it, that you would go buy it and then own it. It's more that um, uh, it's there for you to be inspired by, perhaps uh, 
the blessings that was it was um, imbued with by a great teacher, perhaps with the iconography to inspire your meditation practice. The idea of Oni is kind of out of the tradition. Uh, some great teachers have told me that if they're acquiring a tanka, they prefer that they give a gift and then the tanka is given to them back as a gift. It's not a direct purchase. So it's not so much owning. After all, hopefully the tanka will last much longer than we do and go into further generations. It's there to inspire us and offer the seed of merit to those who see it. It's not about possession. In terms of gems, traditional tankas themselves are actually made from gemstones. These are beautiful minerals from um, the Himalayas. We've done a lot of research on which gemstones or minerals are used in the creation of traditional tankas. We've identified them. And gems themselves are all over tanka paintings. We're talking about gems. These are cabochon cut gems. In other words, they're not made faceted like you might have a diamond ring faceted. This is a traditional type of um, gemstone preparation offered everywhere on tankas at the bottom. This is a monastery um, during a period of high practice. And you can see that over the tankas is hung this textile applique made with many, many small gems. This is the whole screen of gems, gem offerings for this time of year. Real gems are used on tankas. I'd like to uh, draw the distinction between a real gem stone that is sewn on a tanka, and usually it's so heavy that it, it creates um, tearing in the substrate in the tanka support, the silk support. And also any gemstones that are used um, as tanka pigments. I did ask a traditional painter who said that some painters put ground up uh, gemstones and medicine into their uh, traditional tanka pigments. Others don't. It depends on the artist. So that's one answer. I've worked on uh, tanka textiles, textile tankas, where the, the weight of the gemstones, pearls, corals, um, amethyst is so heavy that the, the tanka a support cannot bear it. Next question. How can the authenticity of a tanka painting be maintained during the process of conservation? Again, you're preserving tankas with safe storage handling and display. Please just stabilize. Don't do drastic measures for cleaning or, or repainting. Don't take away, um, well, evidence of historic blessing. It's a sacred art form. Tanka is an art dirty and cannot be cleaned. Please, if you want a new looking tanka, have one painted. I've worked with monks and nuns to preserve tankas, to preserve the authenticity, according to your question, of the most precious tankas in their own monasteries, from their own monasteries. This is very rare precious tanka, it's all painted. The textile is even painted. And I'm working with nuns to preserve it. This is a working tanka. It's used in the nunnery. It's used to um, be there for certain uh, lunar calendar events. It's used as an example of iconography, Avalokiteshvara, for the nuns to be inspired by and it's highly blessed. They're not trying to make it look new. They want it to be used. Like when you're in your car, you want to be able to start it and go from here to there. When you have a blessed tanka, it has to be in usable condition so that you can actually um, use it to serve its function within your monastery and nunnery. This is not a museum. We went from this to this. We work together um, in monasteries and nunneries for preservation so that we be make the tankas back in working order. Another uh, authenticity is when you have to have a replacement part, please make it look authentic. If it's been removed and you need to replace it like this top, you can create authenticity uh, with a label for the viewers that this was added. In painting and consolidation, 
Well, you have to be really careful. I'm consolidating here. And as far as in painting this historic valuable tanka of Padmasambhava, that's up to discussion. I really like to keep it to a minimum. I use conservation colors that are reversible. Authenticity. Next question, and I am keeping an eye on the time. Matthew, I really like this question, significance of tankas. But Matthew, I'm hoping in this picture you're doing a yoga move and that you're not actually sitting on the ledge in this historic cave. Actually, your question is really complicated, and I would love to talk with you about this for hours and hours. The word significance is a value judgment, and conservators are told to not use value judgment words. For example, we're trained to approach every tanka as a great masterpiece and every work of art as unique so that we don't say this is worth more financially, so I'm going to... Um, give it more time. But then again, the person that's paying you to do the work, your funder, might say, this is a hugely valuable tanka, and we're going to um, hire you for a year to stabilize it, whereas this is modern and um, it doesn't need much work. It's sometimes up to the owner, a museum, or monastery, the significance. In terms of a conservator, please be careful of your use of significance because so many people feel that the word significance is financial significance, and that has no place in conservation. To understand significance, you have to understand the methods of material of how something is made. For example, there's iconographic significance, and you may lose elements of iconography due to damage. But also, it has to do with um, significance in terms of how it's made due to where it was made and their different techniques uh, through the centuries. And in one part of the Silk Route from another part of the Silk Route, you'd have different tanka techniques depending on where the, the painter was trained. We do a lot of analysis about this. This is, for example, from um, Eastern part of the Silk Route and you could see it has a significance due to the age and the uh, iconographical content. It has a significance due to the methods and materials also. And that's so important for planning your preservation treatment. Have to know what things are made from, especially contemporary. Significance is there in the offering substances. Significance is there in the the details that you may not be able to see with your eye. And that's why we use different lighting and post capture apps on our phones that show us so much about uh, details of uh, methods and manufact of manufacture and also iconography that you cannot see. So significance can be revealed by use of conservation observation. Significance about religion, okay. Some tankas are not even Buddhist. They're of the Bun religion, which is quite important. This is not a Buddhist tanka, it's a Bun tanka. That's significant. And this is a significant tanka. It's from the Sven Hedin collection because it's so rare. It's about 10 feet and it's all silk. So few silk tankas have lasted centuries. That's significant due to its rarity. Thank you for your question of significance. Sign significance, and this is me in a museum, not a monastery. We could have a discussion about tankas, their significance in museums. I know we're out of time, so we'll have one last question, and then I'd love questions from the live audience. This is her question. In the video, and that's the complete tanka, tanka conservation video, which you can have a link to, I observe someone wrapping their tanka painting in plastic sheet, keeping in mind the natural environment. Is there a sustainable way to preserve tanka paintings where plastics are not used? What a great question. The thing is that I'd say plastics, okay, are bad for the environment, but plastics can also be terrible for the tankas. Someone decided, for example, to keep the dust off 
paintings, wall and, and tankas, using plastic sheeting. When it gets warm during the day, moist air becomes trapped behind the plastic. Then when it gets could not contain the moisture anymore, temperature and relative humidity, because cold air cannot hold as much moisture as warm air, and therefore moisture starts condensing onto the painting, causing damage from the plastic cover. This can create a lot of mold, and it makes the painting look like water has been poured on it, which in fact it has. So you don't want to trap air next to your vulnerable treasures when you know there'll be changes in temperature and relative humidity, because that creates condensation, either in framing or wrapping with plastic. This is covered in our risk assessment chapter in the resource. There, here you have mold behind the plastic glazing in this tanka framing technique. You could see the mold growing. This nunnery has plastic over its paintings that's there to prevent monsoon damage, but actually it creates more damage from condensation and mold growth. Behind her, you could see you, that the beautiful wall painting is there, but its iconographical features are not even visible. I really don't recommend the use of plastic, either on wall paintings or on tankas. And this is very common, people feel they are preventing damage to their tanka during the monsoon, but actually you're getting a lot of condensation and mold growth inside. It's really not recommended. And I know the question was about sustainability, but I'm actually very concerned about the use of plastics on tankas as it creates damage. This entire statue is wrapped in plastic and that would be a lot of plastic for the landfill indeed. That's to keep it dry. And this is right before it was consecrated. Also to keep it from people's view, because it had to be blessed and consecrated in a big um, offering ceremony. And so it was wrapped in plastic. I do understand your concern. And science is developing new substances that are biodegradable that can replace plastic in these uses. And hopefully, uh, for example, like Tyvex, as they can allow some exchange of air so that you don't get condensation. And also, hopefully, that they won't end up in the landfill, which is your concern, and that they will biodegrade. So it's a very good question, and it has brought up other uses of plastic which are damaging to our tankas. As a matter of fact, New tanka forms are in fact plastic themselves. And so will this calendar tanka end up in the landfill after its date is gone? You find these all over the Himalayan region calendar tankas. And next year, will this, what will happen to it? It's made entirely made of plastic. And again, this is a traditional tanka, but new tankas have their iconographic panel printed on plastic substrates. There, I've kept to our time. I so appreciate the questions of the students. Thank you. And if I haven't had time to fully answer your questions, students, please get in touch with me after. I'd be delighted to uh, Zoom personally with you and we could talk about your questions further. And now for the other guests on this Zoom live today who haven't had a chance to send me their questions, I'm here for your questions. And for those that will be watching this presentation in the future in video, I also be very interested in hearing your questions and we could have a Zoom and discuss your Tonka preservation questions. Definitely. Again, thank you. So we've got Feroza ma'am online. Feroza ma'am, uh, you have unmuted yourself. You can go ahead with yes. the questions. I have unmuted myself. It's been a fascinating lecture and uh, we found uh, so many points of interest. And uh, I know that you're sitting in Nova Scotia and Canada. It's morning time for you. And what, when did you begin this interest in Tankas? 
what drove you or attracted to attracted you to thankas uh, if you could uh, let us the audience know what was the motivation behind that my second question which i will ask right now is that when you went into the monasteries uh, the monks and the nuns you were teaching them but was there any teaching from them to you and how did they receive that and uh, thank you so much many of us here who are on the webinar today have been familiar with your work and some of us have not but i was delighted to read up and correct me if i'm wrong that you also worked and studied under a very beloved figure who has visited us in bombay for years and years and years unfortunately not with us today but i definitely would like to acknowledge professor walter spink who spent so much of his so many summers with us it's unbelievable about 45 summers i believe or more with his students so i will just end here and with my two questions and thank you in advance thank you Thank you, Feroza. Uh, Professor Walter Spink was uh, one of my main mentors. I actually studied um, uh, Buddhist iconography and have a master's in Asian art history under Professor Spink. And we decided that I would not go on for a PhD and become an art historian since I had already begun conservation research in monasteries uh, previous to that. And um, we were in touch through the years and I would send him images of monasteries I was working in and he'd send me questions. And he said um, shortly before he died that of all his graduate students, I was the one that was actually um, making a difference in that I was helping to preserve the materiality of what other people are just writing about. And I didn't take that as a personal compliment. I took it um, as gratitude towards Professor Spink for encouraging me in conservation. So thank you for bringing him up. Now, your next question. So really, Professor Spink is also very important. Thanks. Um, the next question, um, I don't work uh, and teach in really in monasteries. I hope I didn't express it that way. I'm a guest in monasteries. I'm invited by the head teacher of the lineage. I wouldn't be in there unless I were invited in. And I work uh, with respect as a Buddhist and I work with the monks and nuns. I've never put myself in a superior or teaching position. We work together. I am always researching and learning as much about traditional methods and materials as they are about current science. It is totally collaborative. We're working together. So um, I would never presume to be called a teacher in a monastery. I am grateful to uh, be invited to work in monasteries and we are working with, we are working together. And many times I've had the honor of um, ha uh, having the opportunity to be there for Buddhist teachings while I'm there, working in preservation also. So um, I hope that clears that up. Uh, I'm a guest in monasteries and I work with, and I totally respect what goes on there in traditions. Now, how did I get interested in all this? Uh, Jason had a museum behind him in his screen. Uh, I grew up in New York City and our school class, when I was age seven, we went around to museums. We took the subway and we went to museums. We went to the Met, we went uh, to the Museum of New York and my favorite, the Museum of Natural History in New York, which is now one of my clients. And at age seven, I saw my first tanka and never forgot it. Then I began to meditate. And later in life as a conservator, I got to work on that very tanka that I saw when I was seven because it was having problems. And the museum is one of my clients. So I believe in education, museum education for children, museum outreach to school classes, because it is at a young age that children learn about preservation. They learn about material culture, their own and others. Museum education is so important and I'm an example of it. Uh, I have a question for you, if I could go ahead. Yes. 
so when you're looking at the material and technology of a thangka, uh, how did you identify the chemical makeup of the pigments? Was it via an XRF machine or something else? Yes. I've been researching with other scholars and um, scientists the composition of tanka pigments since 1970. And I actually was trained as a tanka painter. And uh, one of my masters had pigments he brought with him uh, from the Himalayas. And at the time that was in, let's see, I started researching pigments in 1970. And then uh, in 1976, I was training in tanka painting and we were researching then and now I have uh, colleagues who are conservation scientists who have the, all the toys. And so the research we're doing uh, involves uh, the generosity of my colleagues who are conservation scientists who have uh, the tool you talked about and others and other tools that are going to be developed. And we've done quite a bit of publishing um, on scientific research. And again, I'm very grateful to my colleagues who are conservation scientists, uh, for example, Jennifer Mass. Great. Uh, so, uh, Firozan ma'am, now I'll be calling uh, Anita ma'am to- I have uh, one on... Oh, okay. okay. Uh, I presume we're in your home, Anne. I hope we're not intruding, but I am intrigued about the tankas that are hanging in your home. Were they something we saw during the presentation? or something else yes much better what are those three thank you i have a tanka study collection but i'm not a collector i use them for um, instruction in other words um, hands-on for monks and nuns hands-on for conservation uh, technicians and scientists uh, but i do pay attention as buddhist to the iconography so uh, because of the world pandemic the tankas you see behind me, and this is my writing room because I'm still writing, writing uh, the res preservation resource for monks and nuns. Uh, these are medicine Buddha tankas. In other words, that's the traditional medicine Buddha. Both of these tankas are uh, contemporary, uh, painted with uh, traditional ground pigments, but uh, the contemporary, contemporary form of them they're in contemporary uh, textile mountings, which are based on traditional. And uh, I have them here uh, because they're appropriate in terms of iconography for the pandemic situation. But I also have these medicine Buddha tankas hanging here because they are contemporary. And therefore the beautiful Nova Scotia freezing cold light that's coming through my window uh, we did have a little bit of summer, but now it's getting cold, but I love daylight. So the daylight that's flooding through my window, uh, illuminating me and the tankas uh, will definitely cause them some damage. Uh, so that therefore I don't have my um, 1600, 1700 uh, highly damaged, fragile tankas hanging um, uh, from my study collection in my writing room. This is a calculated risk for slight damage to these contemporary medicine Buddha tankas. And so that's why another reason that these are the tankas that are hanging here in my writing room from which we are talking. And again, the iconography is appropriate for the pandemic and also um, they're pretty sturdy. So that's why I think that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, one was painted in, in Bhutan and one was painted um, in Dharamshala, both by traditional painters and the textiles sewn by traditionally trained tailors. Thank you. Great question. So I now call upon uh, Dr. Anita Rane Guthare, the head of the Department of Ancient Indian History, Culture and Archaeology to take on a few questions uh, which are in the chat box and to give the vote thanks. Dr. Anita. Thank you, Jason. My video is off, but uh, I can ask a question over here. Uh, what is the standard material feature of fabric which uh, they have used in the paintings? This was a question asked by Miral Gada. So, Dr. Ann, can you just tell us about it? 
Yes, certainly. Traditionally, they were painted on cotton. Uh, the cotton was hand woven in the past on um, narrow looms. So therefore, most traditional tankas are, have big seam, they're seamed together. The support is cotton that is seamed together. And the seam is finished so well, uh, both in, in its creation of the support, the water support, but also with the application of the ground that you don't even notice them. So therefore, the cotton support uh, seamed together, you can see more about the support from the reverse. When I look at a tanka, examine it, I examine it from the reverse first. I uh, see about the condition of the support, how many seams it has in it, um, if it is indeed cotton. Because there are, and these are the exceptions, some tanka with silk supports. Now we're not talking about all textile tankas like we saw the huge one which are applique, we're talking about uh, traditional ones. You're talking about the panel of iconography. And yes, some are painted on silk. And these are so rare. Uh, in answer to the, one of the questions, I showed a silk support tanka and was significant due to the fact it still exists because it um, was kept in storage for so long. That's this is the Sven Hedin collection in Sweden. Very, very rare that a silk support tanka would last because the silk deteriorates. It's so fragile. So yes, there are silk support tankas. And oh. I've seen just a few leather supports, but those are very provincial. So cotton, cotton, cotton for support. Rare that you would see silk because they simply don't last, but they have an entire different aesthetic. And sometimes the silk ones are very, very beautiful. And um, then very, very rare leather. Um, these days, of course, you have plastic and, and digital and paper. Yes, um, that's a very good question. Now, some people feel that it's not cotton because of regional styles. For example, in the eastern part of the Silk Road, you might have a tanka support that's very, very finely woven. It almost looks like silk, but it's not. It's very fine. The support is fine. The ground on top is fine. The paint layer is fine. So some people feel those are actually not cotton, but they are. Whereas more central on the Silk Road, perhaps um, the style was to have a coarser weave, a stronger weave of the support, and still perhaps on the narrow loom and seam together. Um, and therefore that's rec more recognizable as cotton, even under the ground layers. And the reason, therefore, some people feel that it's, uh, they're painted on silk, it has to do with the regional style where the support is so finely woven and thus very fragile. And that's from the Eastern region of the Himalayas. Well, thank you, Anna. It was a very exciting lecture, mainly because uh, we have taken students from the Museum Society of Mumbai, as well as uh, uh, AIC, the Department of Ancient and Culture, to Dharamshala, Bhutan, and Sikkim to the workshops of Thanka. And one more thing really fascinated me was that you are a student of Dr. Walter Spink. He was also my teacher. And uh, the medicinal Buddha, which you showed behind, he had shown us the only image of the medicinal Buddha right in Bombay, Mumbai, at Kanheri Caves. So I have, you can say, soft feelings. We call him as Vaishakcha Guru over here. And so, Thank you very much for an exciting lecture on the conservation of hankas over here. And I think my students have really asked, they have really benefited from this. We have it as a part of a syllabus also. And I'm glad our students have really enjoyed it. So on behalf of the Museum Society of Bombay, Mumbai, the Department of Ancient Indian History, Culture and Archaeology, St. Xavier's College, and the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrale, I thank Anna Shackle for a fantastic lecture.